So I have it to the rest of chapter 3 for the text this morning. Um, we're not going to go all the way there, but uh, I'm not going to do a sermon, though, on 31 to 36, because these are themes that and things that are talked about all over in John um, uh, 31 to 36. So uh, I'm going to read our text that we're mainly focusing on is 22 to 30. And so I'm going to read that. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of the John's disciples and a Jew over purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, Look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. If there's one thing uh, that all of us want in life, and it's like a drive, I'm going to put this out the way, um, a little driving like motivational factor that undergirds what we all do, it's happiness. Everybody wants to be happy. And this comes out, um, it's not something that's expressed in everyday conversation, um, but it's like assumed. Uh, you know, when somebody's doing something, you might think it's weird, like, man, what is that guy? It's like, I do, and you're like, Often the response you'll hear, well, if it makes them happy, just let them do it. You know, it's just an assumption. Somebody's depressed. What do you do? You go get counseling. Some people get medication. You don't want to be depressed. You want to be happy. And uh, it's my, one of the things on Scripture is that things aren't always uh, on the surface that it's what's driving. It's stuff that's underneath. Occasionally it comes to the surface. And that's what it is with happiness. It's a driving factor in people's lives. It's what everybody wants. Everybody wants to be happy. Now, I've used this illustration before, and I can just hear somebody uh, in the audience saying, yeah, right, uh, I hate my job, I hate my boss, and I go listen to that guy every single day. What do you mean? Well, first, you shouldn't hate, but second, um, second, um, what I would say back to that is uh, going to a job that you hate um, makes you happier than not being able to pay your bills and being homeless. So you still go to a job because it makes you more happy than being homeless. Everybody's doing what makes them happy. Now, the problem is, and there's nothing wrong with that, everybody should pursue joy. The problem is, we pursue it often in the wrong way. We're pursuing it in a path that is the wrong path. The world tells you that the path to joy, the path to happiness, is advancing in life. And we'll, uh, we'll come back to that in a moment. Right now, the first thing I want to do is I want to focus on this statement that the disciples say to John in, in verse 26. Before I say this, I want you to know, this statement, it's an arrow. This is an arrow. This is an arrow flung by Satan at the heart of John and the heart of Christianity. Look at 26. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. That is a subtle dagger. Let's not switch the imagery. It's a, let's, let's go with the arrow. You guys know that. What I mean by arrow is... Um, you guys remember those old cartoons where like a Cupid would, he would shoot an arrow and you get whoever he shoots like is, is just full of love or they're, they're wanting to love somebody. Well, Satan is often uh, described as uh, shooting arrows, only his doesn't have love on the end. It has like poison and, and it's meant to be venomous. And I agree with my own observation of the text and everybody I've read that that statement by the disciples has resentment in it. Um, whenever they say, um, 
he's baptizing and all are going to him, there's jealousy there. Um, what's being said is, and it's real, I, get, I get it, it's really hard to understand how people who had their entire ministry was to point to Jesus Christ can now be jealous of Jesus, but um, it only may, with what John is going to say, it's the only way that makes sense of it. Uh, and, and the reason for that, and, and the way I, I put that together, is this is very early in Jesus' ministry, and perhaps it's not settled in their mind that Jesus is the Messiah or the Christ. And John himself, when he gets arrested, he himself is going to doubt Christ. He's going to be in prison, and he's going to send people out and say, are you the one, or should we look for someone else? And, and so I think this is what's happening here. Well, the reason why they're saying that is because their job their position is to baptize. And they had a ministry where everybody was coming to them. And now all of a sudden, everybody's going to Jesus. And that's why it's being brought to John. And that's an error. And I'll explain why in a minute. But I want to, this morning, uh, before, uh, I want to look at this error. I want to study this error. I want to uh, see how it got formed and how it is being aimed at John. So, let's look at the origins of it. Now, there's only, there's not much context here. There's only a couple things mentioned. Uh, it does say, uh, at the very beginning, there's two baptism sites. Uh, Jesus and his disciples are baptizing uh, in, in parts of Judea. And, and uh, it's going to say in 4.2, actually, that Jesus himself uh, isn't baptizing anyone. And he's saying that for a, a specific reason. I can't go into that. Uh, but it is important that Jesus himself isn't baptizing um, and in that text, too, it's also an important thing. The Pharisees now know that Jesus is making more disciples than John. And he's growing in popularity. And this becomes a problem uh, for, not for Jesus, but for others. And so uh, the other end is John's disciples are baptizing. So Jesus has a baptism site. John has a baptism site. And in John's disciples' minds, it, it's becoming a competition. And the only thing that we know about this like arrow that's being pointed at John. And, and I say that because anytime uh, in Scripture, I think spiritual warfare is going on in every text and behind any kind of temptation, any kind of uh, attack, uh, Satan is behind this. And uh, you see in Scripture where occasionally it'll be very explicit. It'll say like something like Satan entered Judas, like he's using men, willing men as pawns to uh, have spiritual warfare. but what we see here is uh, he creates this arrow, and the only way it comes about is through this conversation that happens. This is the only thing we see. The baptism and then this conversation here in verse 25. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification. That's it. That's all the information we're given. There's a, there's a Jew, and they're having a discussion, and it's about purification. This is about purification. Uh, of course, it's going to be about water, and, and baptism is going to be involved with that. And so, this statement that they bring to John happens here through this conversation. So, it's, this arrow is created in conversation, and I'm going to say it's also sharpened in this conversation. Now, what do I say by, uh, mean by that? John, uh, first off, this is going to blindside John. You yourselves, you can be anywhere in the world. You can be in your kitchen. You can be at home, not thinking about anything, doing all the right things. And there can be other people, Christians, whoever, having conversations. And this conversations can be creating a temptation something that can cause you to stumble, and then all of a sudden it's going to get brought to your attention and it's going to just blindside you. You can just be living your life and other people can be um, creating some kind of temptation that will hit you. And this is what's happening with John. They're having a conversation. And the only way that a temptation is going to be made and sharpened is uh, where it's going to lead to jealousy and, and bitterness is if people already have a hard, bitter heart to begin with. That's the only way jealousy is going to take root. And so, Satan goes to these disciples who are having, you know, these little hard hearts, and through this conversation that they're having with each other about purification, somehow they start comparing what they're doing to what 
Jesus is doing, and they're noticing that Jesus has more people. Everybody's leaving us. We had this great ministry, and, and, and now they're leaving us, and they're going to Jesus. And you can just see Satan, like, taking that arrow on their rock-hard hearts, and he's just, like, sharpening it. You know, they say iron sharpens iron, and uh, in the Christian, when we're, we're Christians, when we're together and we are talking about verses and are sharing our faith together, uh, we're sharpening one another, you know. But hard, bitter hearts can also sharpen each other. They can clarify and hone in on their arguments. They can hone in on their temptations. They can hone in on persecution. They can make it more sharp, more pointed. And this is very pointed at John. John loves ministry. He loves what he does. Every single day he goes out and baptizes. Every single day he goes out and he tells people to repent and be baptized uh, for the Messiah's here, or the Messiah's coming. So he does this every single day. And people are just flocking to John and flocking to John. And, and now all of a sudden, everybody's not coming to John and they're going to Jesus. And John may not even be thinking about this, but the disciples are. And through that conversation, they're now going to bring it to John. I mean, you can imagine if you had a job you liked and you were proud, let's say you're the, the big guy at work, uh, you're the boss, whatever, and, and not just having that authority, but people actually like being around you. People would actually come to you. They just they generally want to be around you. And then all of a sudden, uh, somebody else gets hired and he's promoted above you and Everybody starts going to him, and they actually demote you. How are you going to feel? It's going to be a temptation to have resentment and jealousy. Everybody in here has a line. Let's just say um, duct tape, right? So there's a line, and then... Maybe a foot in front, there's another line, and then another line, and another line, and another line. And all of us have, we're standing on some line, and uh, this represents where we're at in life. Some people are further than others. Like, there's some people ahead of us, there's some people behind us, but there's always this next point on the line that we can go to, um, to advance in life. It just, the next point represents an advancement in life. and. What's being asked of John? John is all the way at the very end. He's got the best ministry, the only really godly ministry going on at this time. He's the one pointing people to repent and come to the true Messiah, not all these false messiahs. And so John is at the very end. If we had all in a room, he would be at the very end of the building at the last line. like He's at the, the highest point. And what's happening is God is asking him to go to the very end. Accept your changing ministry. Decrease. Fade away. And so that's what's going on here. And it's telling John, you know, don't, uh, this temptation that they're creating is telling John, don't accept what, what God's doing. You've been so faithful to God all this time, and now he's just wanting you to accept a lesser position. He's wanting somebody else to have all the glory now. And can you imagine what this would have done to the Christian movement where somebody like John, who was the biggest witness for Jesus, would now be resentful and jealous of him? And Satan, um, in our world today, I, I'm, technology is neutral. I'm not against the internet, I'm not against TV. Um, but it can be used for good or it can be used for bad. Um, Satan has used these things to like mass produce temptations, mass produce arrows for all of us. Um, everything, uh, everything that you get on with advertisements and things like that, all of those things are aimed at making you discontent with your current position in life. You get on the, you get on the internet and you go to check out your email. Um, I don't even know how many ads I have in my email. It's ridiculous. You can't even go to a website anymore uh, and look at something without them like, you want 10% off? Put in your email. Uh, oh, you don't want 10% off? Okay. Um, 
Or you go to a store, you just want to buy a shirt, like, let me get your email and all this other information, you know, your firstborn, all this stuff. And so um, they just want so much information. Then you get sent an email and, uh, and you get on and you like, look, oh, oh, that jacket you've been eyeing for a couple months, now it's 30% off. And now in your mind, like, oh, I need this jacket. I, I want a jacket. I got to have it. Have, I got to have it now. And, or you get on TV and turn on HGTV and it's just this, this perfect living room. Like, well, I like this living room. I want to have something like that. Or another show and women are saying, oh, wow, this guy is very successful. And perhaps you start comparing them to your husband. Or the opposite, oh, this woman's younger. And you compare him, compare her, uh, her to your wife. Everything is aimed at making you discontent. And you are being bombarded with temptations day after day in so many ways, in so many uh, subtle ways and explicit ways. And it's aimed at making you discontent and wanting you to be resentful with what God's given you in life. This is what's happening. Um, The idea is if we bring it back to the line, you're standing here, and whether this is a position, maybe you want a position at, at work and it opens up and um, whatever it is, there's a shiny object placed at the next line, right? I told you there's many lines. The next line is placed. And now you're looking at this shiny new object and now you are not happy with where you're currently at because you've got to get to the next point. You've got to get to the next point. And that's really what all this is selling us. You don't really want the jacket. You don't really want the living room. You don't really need all that stuff. If you go back to that email, what you want is the smile on that model's face who's wearing the jacket. You want the, the smile uh, when you go to your friend's house and he's got a TV that's 10 inches bigger than yours and he's telling you about it. You just want to be happy. All this stuff is selling happiness. If you have this, You'll be happy. Uh, my children, they've taught me so much. Um, I actually never really hung around kids too much until having my own. And, and then I've realized they've taught me so much about life. And really, um, they're kind of like us, except they have no filter. Like, they say things that we want to say and we think, but we just know not to say it. Or we know not to act that way. They, they don't care. They don't care. Um, Genesis, she got it in her mind that she, earlier this week, wants to be a doctor. Oh, she has to be a doctor. She wants to be a doctor so bad. And she's screaming and, and wanting these, these, this toy to help her be a doctor. And they had some kid or something. And Margie and I have decided we're not getting them any more toys uh, for a long time. And the reason for that is, uh, my last church, they spoiled us. We would have like a birthday party for them, like two, three hundred people show up and they'd get toys from everybody. And we've got a basement full of stuff that they don't care about anymore. And <laughs> um, until we hide it for a little bit, bring it back out like it's new. And then it's like, oh, yeah. Um, but anyway, she wanted to be a doctor so bad. And, and so what we did is instead of getting uh, her a kit, uh, Margie, She's a nurse, and so she got some bandages, and she got some band-aids out of a first aid kit. She also got, uh, I don't know how she got it. Did you steal it? Like a stethoscope? You, like, I, don't, I don't know. She came home with some stethoscope and um, never seen it before. Uh, <laughs> said, said Mary on it. Um, <laughs> no, I didn't say Mary. Um, but anyways, we give this to Genesis, and she's so happy. She's so happy for like two days until she sees uh, laying on the coffee table this advertisement that came in the mail and it's about uh, on it, there's some toys in it and she's like, I want this toy, I want this toy. And she's crying for the new toy. And I say, do you want to play doctor? No, no, you know, screaming no. And and just before that, like everybody has a boo-boo all week. She's checking our hearts all this all week. Now she doesn't want anything to do with it. Do you not see how this pursuit of constantly pursuing things, it doesn't lead to joy. By its nature, um, you're constantly being um, unhappy with where you're at. 
by its very nature, you're constantly pursuing the next thing, and you're constantly never being happy with where you are, always wanting to take the next step, always thinking the next thing is where you're going to be happy, the next thing's going to complete me, the next thing's going to make me my life perfect, and it never is. If there's anybody that can tell us about this, it's Solomon. Solomon had the highest position uh, in all of Israel. He's a king. Nobody's higher than that. Not only that, he had the greatest possessions. He had more material things than anybody uh, in the entire world. And and, uh, with women, he had hundreds, thousands of women. This man had everything, and he says it's all vanity. It's all vanity. Now, he doesn't mean that things are worthless, um, but if your pursuit in life is, if you're trying to find happiness in those things, it's not going to happen. You find your happiness somewhere else, and those things are you give thanks to God for. But if those are what you're trying to find joy in, you're going to find those gods are empty. What Solomon teaches us is that you can have every single thing your heart desires. Go home, make a list. I can go vacation here. I, anything you've ever imagined, write it all down. You can have it all, and you won't be happy. And I even think today's economy is evidence of that too. Um, The free market is capitalism. It's say what you want. It's produced more material goods for everybody than any other system or history uh, within history or around the world. Um, Even the people that are in the lowest class, yeah, you know, there's things we still have to fix, but they have more material goods than anybody else throughout history. So everybody has more stuff, and yet we're still not satisfied. We want to switch to a different system. We want to go to like socialism or something. Why? Because we're comparing ourselves to millionaires and billionaires and saying that's not fair, and we need to even it out. Find a different system. The idea is just never going to be happy. It doesn't matter how much you get. And so my point with all of this is that the pursuit of things, the pursuit of moving to the next step, the pursuit of growing in life, that's never going to make you joyful, it's never going to make you happy, and it's never going to make you content. Discontentment, by definition, is unhappiness. So how do we fight? And I want to come back to the narrative with John um, to bring it back around. But uh, John, they've had this statement, and they the statement to John is, it's this arrow, and it's, John, you've had this great ministry. You've been so faithful to God, and uh, all these people have flocked to God, and you've brought a lot of people to God, and now God wants to just take it all away. And you should be discontent about it. You should be resentful. You should be jealous. Compare yourself with Jesus. John gives us two steps to fight discontentment and one evidence that shows us that we are content. Whenever we're faced with any kind of adversity, any kind of sin that's burning within our hearts, any kind of temptation. Um, We always reveal our medicine. We always reveal our anchor. We always reveal um, what we're holding on to. And John, the first thing he does when that thing's brought, he's just fighting it immediately, and he shows us what his anchor is. Uh, Listen to verse 26. A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. Here's what John has revealed in this. He's depending on God's good sovereignty. God's good sovereignty. Anything you have, he's saying this ministry we have, our, the fact that we've had anybody come to us at all, the fact that we've had any kind of role at all in helping uh, in, in God's role in saving the world, that's just that's came from God. And that's a good thing, and... and, and 
The other thing, and so the idea is be joyful, be thankful. Don't be resentful about it. And the other thing is, you guys are opposing God's plan. You know, God is sovereign. Everything we have comes from him. And so if this is what's happening right now, this is God's plan. This is God's will. And so he, he just immediately, rather than get bitter, he immediately fights it with God is good and God is sovereign. The fact that he's given us anything should make us thankful. And so that's what we need to do. We need to understand that God wants what's best for us, which God's idea of what's best and our idea of what's best isn't always the same thing. He wants what's best for us. And wherever you're at in life right now, God chose that position for you. God has chosen your current position in life, wherever you're at. Let me make this real easy. Uh, If you're rich and you've got lots of, and you're at the highest income bracket in here, or if you're poor and you're at the lowest income bracket, whatever it is, whatever your position in life is, God has chosen that for you, at least in this time. He has chosen that for you. Whatever it is in your life, he's chosen that for you. And it's coming from somebody who wants what's best for you. And so if he's saying you can't have something else or whatever, that's God saying that's what you need. Now, I want to say that there is nothing sinful about any position. There's nothing sinful about being rich. There's nothing sinful about being poor. Nothing wrong with that at all. Job, uh, he was the highest, right? He, Job had more money and more blessings and things than anybody in the world. He also was the lowest, right? He got, everything got taken away. Uh, he has, he's on the extreme, which I think is an image of Christ who had everything and then uh, went to great depths of suffering. But Job had everything and then lost everything. There's nothing sinful about your current position. The sinfulness is being discontent when you don't advance and you see others advancing. It's being discontent with your current position, complaining about where you're at, complaining about not being at the next step. And now, and I'm going to give some examples because I don't think it's sinful to buy things. It's definitely not sinful. Um, If you can afford it, then go buy it. If, if you, know, you manage your own finances, as long as you're, you're giving in a way that you think is pleasing to God, uh, you're free to do with your money what you wish. If you can afford it, that's the key. <laughs> if you can't afford it, then that means you're discontent with the income God has said that you should have. And you're discontent with where God has placed you at. And the sin comes in also, you just start comparing yourself to other people. They've got this much, and they're advancing, and they're doing all this, and you think you got to have that as well. What was Job's entire test? What was the entire test for Job? Job's got all these blessings. I'm going to take it all away, and we're going to see if he's going to curse me for the position I've put him in. It's God's will that Job was in that terrible situation, that horrible situation. That was God's choice. He determined that. And Job had a choice to curse God for it or be content with it. In the sense of, um, you can plead to God and, and want to be out of your situation, but you can't complain about God because of it. And so, that's the temptation that Job has. And anything else we have in life, listen to what Paul says. If we have food and clothing, with these we should be content. Anything else, that's just extra that you should just be thankful for. But if we have those basic necessities, there's no reason to be on this path of trying to constantly advance. He's actually going to go on to say if if your whole um, path, your whole pursuit in life is trying to uh, just gain and accumulate and this and that, you fall into a trap. Fall into a trap. 
and it's led some people away from the faith. Why does it work to understand that God is good and God is sovereign? Why does that work? Well, because the reason that you are discontent is because you are focused on a shiny new object that you think is going to make you happy. The mind is everything. The mind feeds the heart. The mind feeds the heart. When you're, you're looking at something and you think that makes you happy, you start, uh, what that does is it elevates this want to a need. This want becomes a, a need. I got to have it. Why? Because it's going to make me happy. And when you do all that, um, whenever you, you, you understand that God is sovereign and God is good, you're shifting your focus away from the shiny object to God and his purposes. And you're no longer looking at the thing that's the source of your anxiety. You're no longer trying to pursue the next thing. But I will say that there's a difference, though, in understanding that God is sovereign and good and accepting God's will. There's, an understand, there's a difference in understanding that this is God's will and accepting God's will. There's a difference between knowing that there's a hammock outside and resting in it. And that's one of the differences between people who say they believe in God and you know, their whole life demonstrates they probably don't know God and true believers is there's a head knowledge and understanding um, that God exists, that there's a hammock there, yet they're not resting in the hammock. They're not trusting it. That's faith, trusting God, resting in him, accepting it. That's the difference. And what's the evidence that we've accepted God's will? What's the evidence that we've accepted God's will for our life? Joy. Joy. Let's look at what John's going to do. John, here's what John's being asked. John, you need to move backwards in life. You need, your, you need to fade away. Your ministry is gone. You need to give up on it. How's he respond? Just the beginning of verse 29 real quick. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. Why, why is he saying that? Well, he, he's using this marriage Im, uh, imagery, which it's actually connected when he talks about purification. That goes back to the wedding at Cana. You think about, I argued there that that was actually about Jesus and his bride. Well, you see this coming up again, and now it is about Jesus and his bride. Well, the bride is Israel uh, at this point. The bride is Israel, and everybody's going to Jesus. John in this picture is, like, he's the best man. And he's saying... Israel is going to Jesus, and that's fitting. They should be. He's the groom. They're the bride. That's, that's appropriate. I'm the best man. I shouldn't want the bride. He's accepting God's will. I, I shouldn't want the bride. That's not for me. I was preparing the bride. Then he goes on. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. I'm so happy that you're taking these people from me. I'm so happy that you're here. Everybody's leaving me, and I'm happy about it. That is legitimately accepting God's will. You could, you could hear people saying it from a place of just duty, like needing to say it, you know, I, I want, I'm, you know, people are going to him, that's right, that's what should be happening. Um, he's like, I rejoice at this. He's fully resting in God's plan. Then he goes on, therefore this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. I'm fading away, he's rising, and I'm thrilled about it. I'm fading away, and I am thrilled. Is that the world? Get less, have less position, have less, um, even when you bring that to the church, 
Success is often determined by um, things that God doesn't determine success. And if you're not, there's unhappiness about it. My joy is complete when the world doesn't advance, they're not happy about it. When they are advancing, they're not happy about it. They're never happy. Do you have joy when you're not advancing in life? Do you have joy in suffering? Do you have joy in demotion? Can you? I can hear somebody saying, um, yeah, I agree with generally what you're saying, but you don't know my specific situation. The reason I haven't got this raise or this promotion at work is because I have a boss over me who's doing it for sinful reasons. Uh, He doesn't want me to advance. He's holding me back for sinful reasons, and I know it's for sinful reasons. I don't want to be insensitive to anybody's situation in life, and I know that being under somebody that can be sinful is difficult. Believe me, I was in the military, and uh, one thing you learn is that anybody over you, uh, especially sergeant and above, uh, or officer, um, they tell you to do something, you have to do it. And certain people would take that to the most extreme, like, don't say a word back to me, don't argue, don't this, don't that. Uh, and if you do, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. Uh, and whatever they say goes, and it just it, and it breeds a lot of sometimes just arrogance. And, um, and you have to just submit to it. You just have to. You can't do anything about it. You have to shut your mouth and do what they say. And it's, it can be hard. And believe, so believe me, I know what it's like to be under people who, um, who just, uh, I want to say, press you, I guess, oppress you. But if that's what, where you're at right now, That's God's will. God has determined that a sinful person is overseeing you right now. Are you going to accept it? Are you going to complain? And I said, you can plead to God about it, but will you accept it? Will you rest in it? The thing is, is what are you going to do? Are you going to go to God and plead and pray, and, and that's perfectly fine. Or, or are you going to be angry and hateful and resentful towards other people? That's discontent. That's discontent with God. That's, that's uh, hating other people. What are you going to do? That doesn't mean your situation will never change. It doesn't mean not go for a promotion. That means being content if you don't get the promotion. Being content if things don't change. When we think about even, you know, the greatest, most humiliating suffering, um, we can think about Jesus on the cross, and it's not just that what men are doing to Jesus. Jesus is enduring the wrath of God. He's enduring enduring great humiliation, though he deserved none of it, and he's in heaven with Uh, all these praises, and he didn't need to even come down and do any of this, but he does. And so you think, you know, of course there's no joy in going to the cross. What does Hebrews tell us? He endured the cross for the joy that was set before him. He is submitting to extremely great suffering And even in the midst of that suffering, there is a deep sense of joy that I am accepting and doing the will of God. Not my will, but yours be done. So, I want to end it on this. If we all agree with this, and and I believe that when you hear these things, um, you're, you're Probably like, yeah, you know, I know this. Sometimes people need to say it, but I know this, but why do, we, why do we not do it? Why are we constantly finding ourselves on this path of pursuit of things? And, and I sort of, when I was thinking of an illustration, I sort of compare it to um, 
going to the gym versus uh, sitting on the couch and watching Netflix and eating junk food all weekend. Now, Netflix and junk food actually sounds like a pretty good time. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> um, I, I, I do uh, occasionally partake in uh, a documentary and some junk food, um, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, but what's the attraction there? The easiest path to joy is that couch in Netflix and junk food. It's easy. Get there, quick dopamine fix, quick little joy. I'm comfortable, I'm happy. That's it. That's why it's quick, it's easy. What's your life going to look like if that's what you're pursuing every day? You're going to gain weight. And any joy you have is actually going to feel artificial. It's going to feel plastic. It's going to feel fake. It's going to be inauthentic, and you're actually going to be depressed. What about going to the gym? I'm sure everybody's like, I don't want to go to the gym. <laughs> I don't want to do that. I'll tell you this. When both are presented, the easiest path to pleasure is Netflix and the couch. The gym does not sound like fun. But I tell you this, it, it, it's, it's harder, it's more work. But once you begin, you start going down that path. I tell you, people that go work out, it just becomes this addiction. And um, the, the joy that you have is a real, uh, authentic, deep joy that you have. And, and, and the people that you meet that go to the gym, you've met them. The meatheads, the, uh, the people that... Uh, uh, well, Mark's run mar marathons and stuff. So, uh, it, but I've been the same way. Don't believe me. I, I'm in that category too, where I've worked out and I've felt it. There, you get a high on life, and you just can't help but talk about it. You just can't help but talk about why, because it makes you so happy, and you just want other people to know. You just become this uh, well source of life to others. You think sometimes you may be a source of annoying people because uh, they don't want to go work out. But uh, but the point is, is what is always easier isn't necessarily What's best for you? What's always easier doesn't necessarily produce the, most, the greatest, most authentic joy. And once you go down this path of um, surrendering my life, dying to self for greater joy, you're going to find life. Jesus says um, the, the person um, who, uh, who seeks his life will lose it. The person who uh, seeks to give his life will find it. And it's not just this, at the end of eternity, I'm going to be granted life. It's like you're finding life in the present. Dying is gain in the present. It's more blessed to give than to receive. Blessed there even connotation of happiness. It's more happy to give stuff away than it is to receive things. And so, I would just urge and say all this and you know, preaching to myself as well, that seek to be content in life and to, I don't know, I'm not going to give any legalistic principles in terms of you should shut off the emails and cancel all the advertisement. You know, that might help. <laughs> you know why? The temptation comes when you read the email. You're not even thinking about it. You log on. Oh, now I got to have a coat. <laughs> like it's, it's just whatever it is for you, like a shake or something. I don't know. But there may be wisdom in that. So let's pray. Father, uh, do just pray for um, contentment in the church. Pray that we would fight against this urge to just keep pursuing things that ultimately end in, not only end in depression, but have spikes of artificial joy and just pray that we would know what true, full joy is. Pray this, and I just ask you this, Father, that we would all know this in, in Jesus' name. Amen.